I'm Fred Cusick at the Country Club in Brookline, Massachusetts. Scene of the 1963 U.S. Open Championship. Fifty years ago, in 1913, the Country Club was the scene of another U.S. Open Championship. From Great Britain came Wilfred Reed and Harry Varden and Ted Ray. From France came a fine professional, Louis Tellier. From the United States, Rochester, New York, a young 20-year-old professional by the name of Walter Hagen in his first U.S. Open tournament. But that 1913 tournament was famous for another outstanding accomplishment in the world of golf. It was won by a 20-year-old amateur from Massachusetts, born in the very shadows of the country club. A young man who went from caddy to champion. The first U.S. Open Golf Championship was held at Newport, Rhode Island in 1895. By 1913, golf had made some progress in the United States, but not too much. The game was mostly dominated by foreign players. As a matter of fact, the country club, host to the 1913 event, had it postponed from June until September to make sure that such players as Harry Varden and Ted Ray could compete in the event. And an outstanding event it was held in 1913. For a boy living just across the street from the country club, it was only natural that he became a caddy and learned to play the game of golf. But to go from caddy to a United States Open champion in only five years is a record any schoolboy might hope to accomplish. Francis Wiemet did just that. He was the Massachusetts State Amateur Champion, had finished second in the qualifying round in the National Amateur just a few months prior to his greatest victory. He was just 20 years old. Since that victory, he's won many outstanding honors. In 1951, he was named captain of the, of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews, the only American golfer to be so honored. Mr. Wiemet, this is a very famous portrait of you as captain of the Royal and Ancient at St. Andrews, is it not? Yes, I'm wearing the captain's regalia there. What about this uh, medal that we see in the lapel? That is the Adelaide, the Queen Adelaide Medal. It was presented to the Royal and Ancient Golf Club to be worn by captains uh, when, they, uh, when they played themselves in. It is the only medal that I know of uh, that you can win by hitting one shot. Just one shot, does Just it? one shot. This was a very famous honor that came to you, the only American to possess it. Uh, what type of club is the Royal and Ancient? The Royal and Ancient Golf Club, Fred, is just like any other club, excepting uh, since the rules were, uh, were uh, organized and developed in Scotland, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club uh, was the father of golf and set down the original playing rules. And any member of the Royal and, and Ancient Golf Club is just like a member of the Country Club or any other club. Uh, it differs somewhat uh, with us. Uh, the USGA, for example, which is a, the governing body in this country, is made up of an association of member clubs. But the Royal and Ancient Golf Club is an individual club made up of individual members. This famous portrait of you was a copy made by former President Eisenhower. Did he not uh, do that and present it uh, to Bobby Jones? That's correct. He presented it to Bob Jones, and Bob Jones loaned it to the Royal and Ancient Golf Club, where it now hangs. Among your other triumphs, Mr. Wiemet, uh, well, you played in the Walker Cup team for many years, did you not? Yes, I enjoyed my competition in the Walker Cup matches. I played a good many times. I think I was associated with 12 of them. Looking at uh, some of the other pictures here at the Country Club, we see one here with the smile of victory going back to 1913, as we see you along with uh, Harry Varden and uh, Ted Ray. Yes, that was taken about 30 minutes after the match was over. Well, the smile of victory, of course, uh, you had that in uh, several national amateur tournaments, two to be exact. Well, I was lucky enough to win the amateur championship in 1914, which uh, gave me a great deal of satisfaction. I felt that someday I could win that, and I did win it in 1914, but it took me 17 years before I could win it again. 
1914, there must have been a lot of pressure on you. Here you were, the National Open champion. Well, you didn't think of uh, pressure in those days, Fred. You played the game as a game. You played it for fun, and uh, your competitors played it that way. Looking back at some of the other honors, there's the We Met Caddy Scholarship Fund. You must be very proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Uh, that Caddy Fund was organized in 1949, and thanks to the uh, very good friends in the Massachusetts Golf Association and uh, the members of member clubs of the Massachusetts Golf Association and many friends in other parts of the country, uh, we've been able to send over 400 boys to colleges of their own choosing. And uh, it has been a source of great satisfaction to me. Caddies, of course, very essential to the game of golf and also equipment. What about uh, equipment then and now? Oh, if you'll come over here, Fred, I'll try and discuss that with you. Okay, what have we here? Well, these are some old timers. I doubt if you're old enough to uh, know what they mean. But these are clubs that were used around the turn of the century. In fact, this one here uh, is older than that. But uh, I want you to take a look at this club. That has a very thick grip. It's got a wooden shaft, and it's got a wooden head with uh, nothing in the face. It's just plain wood. This club here is built the same way, but uh, the face became chipped, and it has what is known as a leather face, which was a customary thing for the professional to put into the face of a club which had become moth-eaten or chewed up. Nowadays, there's certainly quite a contrast in equipment. As we look here at a Walter Hagen set, oh, incidentally, yes. a Walter played in that U.S. Open, didn't Yes, he, Walter huh? played in that championship and might very well have won it. How would you contrast it now as you look at this uh, Walter Hagen driver? Well, of course, these are the last word. These are the finest things that are made today. Uh, they've got a steel shaft. They've got a beautiful face. It's a, a well-balanced club, perfectly balanced. It, uh, uh, the manufacturer can make clubs to suit any player today, any uh, player at all. As we pursue the clubs, let's uh, discuss the irons, too. What about some of the old, old ones? And they had unusual names, did they not? Yes, well, clubs weren't numbered in those days. I'm speaking now 50-odd years ago. They bore names. Uh, they were hand-forged. The iron head was hand-forged. And uh, this, for example, that I'm looking at now is what is called a clique. A clique uh, in playing power would resemble a number one iron. And it's just as difficult to use as the modern number one iron. Mm -hmm. What were some of the other uh, unusual names given the golf club? Well, uh, the club following uh, the, the clique could be a Sammy. A Sammy is a lofted clique at a round uh, back. Uh, Mid-iron, of course, was a popular club. Uh, Lofter was uh, later changed. The name was later changed to Mashie. Then you had a Jigger. And then you had a Mashie Niblick. Then you had a Niblick. And uh, there were such odd items as mid Mashie and driving Mashie, etc. And now, of course, we have the numbers. And uh, we have a variety of clubs. For instance, I'm looking at the Hagen set here. and. No less than three uh, wedges. How are you as a wedge player, Mr. Williams? Well, I'm not a very good wedge player. I do carry a, a wedge. Uh, I could never find use for three of them. I can use one of them. But uh, the professionals have got the game down to such a science today that they use a wedge for 50 yards. They might use it for 90 yards, or they may use it out of the sand. What about the golf professional of today? If he had to play in the tournament such as you did back in 1913 with the equipment that we've shown right here? Well, that's a very good question. I doubt very much. And of course, I always try and avoid comparisons. That is to say, comparing players of one era with another. But uh, having watched Arnold Palmer and Sam Sneed and Gary Player and some of the modern great players, I doubt very much if they could hit a ball as hard as they do with 
this old-fashioned hickory shaft. I don't think it would stand up. I think they might hit the ball uh, uh, offline, whereas with this modern equipment, the steel shaft, they get into the groove and they can hit the ball as hard as they possibly can, knowing that it's going to stay together and knowing that there's no torsion down around the neck and knowing that the ball is going to fly reasonably straight most of the time. What about a prediction now for the 1963 oh, U.S. Fred, Open? I wish you hadn't asked me that question, but uh, if I were a competitor and I could walk up to the scoreboard with an average of 470s, I'd feel I had a fine chance to win. Well, there it is. There's the prediction. And one more point on that uh, 1913 win, as we have here the victorious golf ball, Francis Wiemetz in the center, Harry Vardens, and Ted Rays. And there's the picture of the golf balls used in that 1913 tournament. This has been an interesting look at how golf has changed. Now let's recreate the 1913 Open. Let's get out on the course and we'll walk over to the 17th hole. And I'll try and explain to you what happened. Okay, Mr. Wiemet, what was the uh, weather like in that 1913 tournament? Well, you know, we had two qualifying rounds on Tuesday and Wednesday. The weather was fine. On Thursday, it was quite good for the first two rounds of the championship. But uh, Friday, when we had to play two rounds uh, again, the third and fourth rounds, it was very bad. It rained all day long. How was your play as you moved along? Let's say the first round, the second round, were you satisfied? Did you think you had Well, I was quite satisfied. Uh, I remember starting off by topping my tee shot on the first hole and taking a six, and taking a six on the comparatively short second hole. And after that, I got squared away and finished with a 74, which was extremely satisfactory for me. Of course, all the talk, I suppose, was about Varden and Ray uh, and, and their great potentialities and their great play. Oh, yes, all together. Everybody was keen to see Varden and Ray. They were regarded as the two best in the world. And, of course, we all wanted to see how well the American professional would do, and particularly the, the uh, uh, imported Scotch and English pros. What type of players were Varden and Ray? Could you compare them to anybody today? That is very difficult uh, to do. Uh, the game has changed to a, a great extent. Varden was a, a picture player. He had a beautiful swing, uh, beautifully balanced. Ray was a huge man and a rather awkward player, but a, a, a very effective one. Now, you moved along uh, first round, uh, second, uh, third. When did you feel you, uh, you really had a shot at this uh, Open Championship? Fred, I never really felt I had a shot to win it. Uh -huh. But uh, I kept poking along and uh, staying reasonably close to the, winner, to the leaders. And uh, then you, it gets in your blood. You sort of feel that you've got to keep going. And while you don't think that you're going to win the championship necessarily, you do feel that you're going to put together some good holes and make a good round and let the round stand up for good or bad. Well, really, uh, <laughs> moving along there to the uh, third round, uh, the fourth round in particular, as you started out that day, uh, what was the situation? Ray had already finished, hadn't he? Yes, it's a funny thing. As I was walking down to play my last round, Ray was holding out on the 18th green right in front of me. And we had tied at the three-quarter mark with scores of 225, and uh, he had a 79 for that final round, which gave him a 72-hole total of 304, so I knew exactly what I had to do. That was the target there, right? That is you. correct. And then later, Varden uh, came in and posted a 304, right? Yes, and after I had driven from the first tee, I found that Varden, who was playing ahead of me, was one over five for the first five holes which didn't seem too far out of line. I mean, uh -huh. I felt I could stay within that range. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, uh, you started off a little rough, did you not, over the first nine in the fourth round? Oh, yes. I fell to pieces in the middle of that nine and struggled out in 43 strokes. Then uh, how about your 10th hole? Did you have trouble there, too? That was a nightmare. <laughs> that was a nightmare. And I hit my iron shot off that 10th tee about 20 feet. And 
made a very good recovery shot to the green, but ended up by taking three putts for a five. Uh -huh. Well, then it came down, more or less, as far as you uh, tell the story, Mr. We met to the 13th hole. You knew the situation, and you knew the course that was in front of you if you wanted to at least tie for this Open Championship. Is that right? Yes, I knew that somewhere along the line, on those last six holes, I didn't know where they might come, but I knew that I had to have uh, four pars and two birdies two holes under par. Uh -huh. I didn't know which one. I was hoping that it would be the first one I was playing. Right. Now, the 13th, uh, what did you do there? Well, I didn't play what you would call a very good second shot, but uh, I chipped in from the edge of the green, which gave me one of those very desirable birdies. Right, right. I had a three there. So you had one of your strokes there. I got one of the strokes that I was looking for. And uh, then you moved along. Uh, 14th, was that more or less regulation? Uneventful. That uh, was uneventful. What about uh, 15th? 15th was another exciting affair. Mm -hmm. I missed my second shot so badly it passed to the right of a trap, but I recovered nicely within a foot of the hole, so I got my par four there. Fine. 16, you might have counted on that as a possible I was birdie. sort of hoping all along that I might pick up a two on that hole. It was not a difficult par three hole. And I'd been playing it well, and I had not had a two, and I thought that perhaps I might get a two. You might say it was a, a wish more than anything else. As a matter of fact, I had to hold a nine-foot putt for three. Oh, what a disappointment then. Well, that, it was. Uh, at least you got your three, and we're I still got, within range. I got my three, and I still had a chance on uh, to get a birdie on one of the two last holes. And we're coming to one now, and that's the 17th. Uh, yes. Not, uh, and I'm sure you would want to point out that it's uh, not exactly the same as it was uh, when you played it, Mr. Weeman. That is right. The old green was located to the left of that mound in that general mm -hmm. direction. It was a slanting green. It rolled from right, it uh, ran from right to left. Mm -hmm. You see? Right. Uh, it was uh, protected by a trap in front and some mounds on the right. Mm -hmm. But I got my second shot on the green in a good position, oh, maybe 15 feet from the hole, mm -hmm. and uh, I was lucky enough to hold that putt for that three that I needed so badly. Well, there was, there was your birdie, and uh, certainly a lot of cheers must That's, have gone up at that. Well, they said that uh, <laughs> there was quite a commotion caused by cars on the street and uh, the gallery, but uh, I was concentrating so seriously and so vigorously that I didn't hear anything. Uh-huh. I can well imagine. You still, of course, had to play the, the 18th and, uh, and uh, get your four to uh, stay within contention. Yes, I needed a four to tie. Mm -hmm. I needed a four to tie. And uh, was that uh, fairly uneventful, or uh, how did you feel about well, that? Well, uh, it was not altogether uneventful. I thought I had a great second shot there. Uh-huh. But uh, when I got up to the ball, I found it had hit the top of the mound, and instead of kicking forward, it stopped right there. Uh -huh. And I finally had to chip up about three feet from the hole and was lucky enough to get that putt. We might comment that your caddy at that time, he was 10 years old, Eddie Lowry, oh, right? Oh, yes. Eddie was 10 years old. And uh, how, many, how many clubs did he have to carry for you in that he day? He had to carry 10. Mm -hmm. I probably used seven. Uh -huh. The outside eight. That's amazing. And then uh, coming to the 18th, uh, you uh, you chipped up. Were you uh, about how far away? Oh, my third shot, which was the chip from the top of the mound, was about three, three and a half feet from the hole. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you got that, and uh, there was a, a great moment. You had tied for the... Yes, uh, that gave me a total of 304 strokes for the 72 holes, which equaled both Bob and Ray. Of course, your, your work was not done. You were then uh, had the proud uh, privilege of age 20 of competing against these two top flight professionals in a playoff, right? That's right. What about the playoff? What was the weather like and how did it go? Well, the weather was very uh, humid. Uh, it was misting and we carried umbrellas the early part of the match, but the mist uh, died away. But it was one of those sultry, heavy, uh, soggy days. Mm -hmm. And a strange thing, too, with all the moisture that we had the day before and uh, in the morning of that playoff, we didn't have a single ball in bed mm -hmm. in the fairway. 
That's amazing. Uh, you moved along, and as uh, uh, Bernard Darwin, the British writer who was covering that open tournament and who was your official marker of the time uh, commented, you were a very poised young man of 20. Did you really feel that way? Well, I didn't know. I wasn't <laughs> thinking of poise or anything. I was thinking, Fred, of hitting every ball as well as I possibly could, mm -hmm. making every shot as perfectly as I could. Whether I had poise or uh, lacked emotion, I can't say. I mm -hmm. had a job to do, and I tried to do it. As you moved along, uh, there were opportunities for a young Mr. Wiemet to blow up, but that you did not. Uh, finally, it was Mr. Ray who uh, sort of blew up, did he not, at the 15th and moved out of contention? Yes, uh, it was anybody's match for 13 holes. At the end of 13 holes, I was leading uh, by one stroke. Varden came next. He was a stroke away from me, and Ray was two strokes away. Mm -hmm. So anything could have happened in those last five holes. Mm -hmm. But on the 15th hole, Ray sliced his tee shot into the rough, put a second shot into a trap, took two to get out, and took a six on the hole to our fours. Mm -hmm. So that put him four shots behind me and three behind Varden, mm -hmm. and uh, put him practically out of the running. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it was you and Mr. Varden, right? Practically speaking, yes. Again, the 17th was a pivotal hole right here as we stand on it, it right? It was a pivotal hole, to be sure. What happened there? Well, Varden had the honor by uh, virtue of having made a three on the 13th, and since the other holes, the following holes had been tied, he still retained the honor playing the 17th hole. And he hit a ball to the left, dangerously close to a trap. I couldn't tell whether it was in a trap or not, mm. but I didn't want to take that line. Right. So I hit my ball where I had uh, driven it the day before, well to the right. Mm -hmm to the right-hand side of the fairway, and when we got down to our balls, his ball was in the trap, which has been known ever since as the Varden Trap. Mm -hmm. And that trap was a very difficult trap to play out of. It sloped into a bank, and he was left with a downhill lie, from which it was impossible to play a, a, a phenomenal recovery shot to the green. Mm -hmm. He had to play out to one side. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I put my second shot on the green in two, he got on in three, and uh, I had quite an edge then, particularly right. when a 15 or an 18-foot putt dribbled into the hole for a three. Remarkable. And, of course, again, it was the 17th hole, two birdies on two successive days. Yes, it was quite a, a coincidence that it had to be that same hole on two successive days. And so uh, the 18, you can't say was routine, but more or less it uh, must have been. And uh, you came through with the championship in this head-to-head -head match with Ray and Varden. 20 years old, United States Open champion. That was a very historic victory for you, Francis, we met. Well, it was, and it was one of those things that uh, uh, came out of the blue. I didn't expect to do it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was uh, sort of, uh, 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 the, the way I got into the championship was rather mm -hmm. remarkable. I don't know whether I ever told you that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd been playing the amateur championship at Garden City, and as I was leaving Garden City, having been beaten by Jerome Travers, the title holder, the president of the USGA, the president of the USGA asked me if I would not like to play in the Open Championship, and I said I haven't given it a thought, Mr. Watson. Well, he said, give me five dollars and you're in. Mm -hmm. So that's how I happened to enter the Open Championship in 1913, and came through with the victory. Congratulations, and thank you very much for thank telling the story, much, Mr. Francis. We met, and a great tribute to an outstanding golfer Francis we met came from Bobby Jones. When Francis we met won the Open 50 years ago, he accomplished the first major injection of romance into the American golf. It's trite to say this now, but one becomes increasingly aware every year that this was a real transformation of a state old game into a young man's field of glory. It has been so ever since. There have been many great golfers since we met, but none who gave more to the game. There have been few who played it so well, none who played it more gallantly. As one who was first his awed admirer, later his fellow competitor, and now, as always, his staunch friend, I salute him with all possible fervor. This is Fred Cusick from the Country Club.
This has been a special program honoring Francis we met on the 50th anniversary of his victory in the United States Open Golf Championship, September 1913.